All righty, welcome back, ladies and germs. All prophecy fulfilled. Okay, we are going to ease our way into the New Testament. I know you're thinking, well, it's about bloody time, Ryan. Uh, and we're going to begin to look at, we'll start with Acts chapter 10 and 11, and how Cornelius, a Gentile, as you know, drops into Peter's place to see what condition his condition was in. Now, as far as Peter thought, at least initially, Cornelius, his condition was, well, Gentile. That was his condition. He was something other than, or he was outside the law practicing covenant community of the Jews to which Peter belonged to. In fact, this would make Cornelius unclean in the sight of Peter, right? Unfit and even unlawful, really, Peter says. Um, to even be uh, in the company of the likes of a law-practicing Jew like Peter. Well, you know what? Peter discovered something. That through faith and through a new covenant, what condition Cornelius' condition was in was subject to change. In fact, it had changed. Um, and you know why? Well, yeah, you're probably thinking, faith! It's all about faith, man! Well... Yeah, faith was certainly one aspect, one part of it. That was one component. But what was the other? Well, here it is. The other component was had to do with what kind of Gentile Cornelius was. Or what particular goyim Cornelius was a part of. Cornelius was an Israelite Gentile. He was of the Goyim, but he was a seed of Abraham. He was a descendant of the scattered lost sheep of the house of Israel, considered as Gentile and unclean by his long lost Jewish Israelite brother, Peter. And I am going to show you how Scripture itself demonstrates this and how Cornelius serves as just one individual example of what was true of the whole, of the collective body of Israel, which included scattered Israelites, which included all Israelites out in the Goyim, uh, who'd been alienated from God and the covenant. In fact, don't, don't tell anybody this, okay? It's kind of a secret. Uh, I believe that all individual cases that we see in the New Testament of Gentiles coming into the, uh, the New Covenant, like Cornelius, they serve as just that. Individual examples or case studies of what all the prophets spoke of time and time again. How Israel's lost sheep would come back into Israel's fold through a new covenant in, uh, uh, in their last days uh, of that first covenant. Okay, so just like Hosea chapter 1 predicted, I've been, man, I have just used and abused Hosea, haven't I? And I'm going to again today. Um, just like Hosea chapter 1 predicted, in the place where it was said of uh, uh, people uh, like Cornelius, you are not my people, uh, it was now said of him, you are sons of the living God. Okay, now why the change? Why the change of condition? Because Cornelius was a part of a particular group of people being ba gathered back to God in the last days. Uh, now when would this happen? Well, according to Hosea, right? When the children of Israel and the children of Judah would be gathered together. And that's what we see happening. Folks, Cornelius was a descendant uh, of the children of Israel who'd been dispersed into the Goyim, the Gentiles, the nations 
nations, and thus he was regarded as a Gentile. And I'm going to show you that. So, okay. Up to this point, we are on lesson number nine, I think it is. What do we know? What have we really uh, gained uh, as far as the, the big picture here? Right off the, just what do we know for sure? Well, here's what we know. I, I kind of made a quick list of six things. Number one, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that right off the bat, that scattering of Israel theme, that was introduced you know, way back in Deuteronomy, how they forsake the covenant, uh, they would experience the curse of the law, the curses of the law, and how that theme was built upon, it was developed, it was preached by all the prophets, um, and this exact scenario played out with Israel's dis dispersion and their assimilation into every nation, every nation under heaven. So, number two, we know that from Hosea again that God's people Israel through their aforementioned forsaking the law and their um, uh, subsequent scattering right um, would be referred to Yahweh himself as not my people we know that but later on again just like I just said they would be called sons of the living God when both houses were joined together number three we know that Israel we know that Ephraim would be made far off far off man no way that's far out far off uh, it, and that becomes a very common phrase by the prophets so much so that you got the likes of like Daniel and Isaiah and they refer both to to Israel uh, uh, far off into the nations and Israel near okay so listen to this a, a real distinction develops within Israel Man, that's huge. A distinction develops within Israel. And yes, this would be the Jew-Gentile distinction. I mean, it's just right there. Boom. It's not that hard. Um, a wall of separation, if you will, between law-practicing Jews, uh, mainly those who were near, right? And, and then you have, on the other side, you had those who had forsaken the law with their assimilation into pagan cultures, um, within the surrounding nations. Number four, we know that Yahweh said Israel's future generations, that is their, their children, if you will, would be strangers or estranged from him or to him. So, you know, some translations, they actually say these cut off children would be as pagan. I, I don't know if that's a proper translation. I, would, I think strangers or estranged would be more accurate. So Yahweh explicitly says, leave them alone. Give them up into their pagan nations, their pagan practices. And uh, I'll get back to them in the last days. Number five, we know through many, many, many verses that I've shared thus far that Israel would become defiled they're dirty they are unclean i uh, hosea i think four and five i talked about that i read some passages from ezekiel 23 i think that israel would be unclean number six we know that in spite of all this doom and, and gloom bad news we also see the good news pepper throughout and alongside uh, the, the, the bad news and the good news and it, it, it's kind of like a, a juxtaposition to it uh, and to use the language of the prophets Israel was promised a gathering from where well from all nations they were promised a gathering from the four corners of the land from the earth they were promised to gather a gathering from the north from the south from the east and from the west and that's very important language to remember so in light of these six very clear established biblical facts that we do know in light of these things okay in light of these let me ask you a couple questions be honest, please. Number one, is it really that difficult to see how through their history, uh, their split, their scattering, how Jews with the law regarded anybody and everybody else as goyim, as Gentile, as other, which would include the descendants, the cutoff Israelites, those in the nations without the law? not practicing law, not practicing, practicing circumcision. Is it really that difficult to see how Jews would regard the northern tribe as, or the northern tribes, northern kingdom as Gentile? Is that difficult to see? 
is it really that difficult to see that uh, how all, and I mean all, in or among the nations, including these, these lost Israelites, were regarded as unclean? Gentiles. Is, is that difficult to see? Regardless of how they got there or when, you know, how they became to be in their particular goyim, their particular nation. No, that's not difficult to see. It, it's not that hard. In fact, doesn't it make perfect sense in light of the story, in light of those uh, six very clear established facts that we talked about? Um, I don't think it is. I think we just don't like to see it. We don't want to see it. Because we see the writing on the wall. Uh, was it really that difficult to see? Like last lesson, for example, in Romans chapter 1, that Paul was clearly drawing from Hosea chapter 4, right? Which was all about Israel. And applying that to his Gentile audience in Romans chapter 1, which was likewise all about Israel. Israel knew, Israel is without excuse, uh, Israel exchanged God's glory, uh, you know, or their glory, um, and the truth for a lie. It's not that difficult to see that. So is it really that difficult to see, or is it, that, is it too difficult to accept, maybe that's the question, that Romans chapter 1 contextually dovetails into Romans chapter 2, that makes sense, right? And that's exactly what Paul's talking about uh, when he refers to those who sin apart from the law, and, you know, those who do not have the law, uh, those who were Gentiles for sure, right? Gentile Israelites, descendants of scattered Israel. That's not difficult, is it? That these Gentiles in Romans chapter 2, without the law, sinning without the law, apart from the law, they were Israelite Gentiles. Well, why can that be? Because it's right off the tail end of Romans chapter 1, which is right about, about Israel. It makes sense. Right? And then those who did have the law and those who sinned under the law, well, those were the Jews. So you, you see that dichotomy. It's not difficult. But all of them... All these Israelites, Jew and Gentile, all would be subject to the judgment and all would be subject to facing God's wrath. Well, why would that be? Well, because all, all Israel were within or under that first covenant umbrella of Israel. You know, it, it, it's just, I don't think it's difficult to see. I think it's just difficult for us to accept that the distinction between Jew and Gentile is within all Israel. I've been saying that all lesson. It's within all Israel, not all humanity. And in my opinion, when we do this, when we accept this, and it, man, it just makes a heck of a lot more sense out of pretty much everything else we read. Um, and so, for example, I have a couple examples here. Matthew chapter 18. So Jesus is talking to his Jewish audience at this point. And he's talking about lost sheep. Well, that sounds familiar. And um, like I've mentioned a few hundred times, you're not going to find one reference to, to God's sheep by, <clears throat> by Israel's prophets that is not re explicitly referring to Israel. Right? God's sheep were Israel. Now, Jesus said that there's going to be more rejoicing over one stray sheep that had gone astray, but then had come back into the fold, as opposed to the 99 who did not stray. Huh. Well, you know, that kind of sounds like Israel's story, doesn't it? Right? Some strayed, some did not. Some were far, some were near. Right? Some were far into the nation, some remained home. Now, it kind of sounds like the prodigal son story as well, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um... But then he said that if one of their brothers, now remember what I said about the contextual roots uh, and the, the Israel-centric underpinnings and meaning of brethren, right? Right? That goes back to the 12 tribes. That goes back to the 12 brothers of Israel, right? So if one of their brothers was continuing in sin against them and they refused to be reconciled to their brothers through the church, he explicitly told his Jewish audience to regard those brothers as Gentiles. Ethnicos. Regard your Jewish brother 
to be as a Gentile, he says. Matthew 18, 15 through 17, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. If he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, did you catch that? Jesus told his fellow Jews that an unrepentant brother, and at this point, he's only talking to Jews, folks, that these Israelites, these Jews, if you will, they could be Jews, they could be Israelites, but they are brothers. And he tells them that their fellow unrepentant, unrepentant Israelite brother should be to them as a Gentile. Folks, this is exactly what the non-law practicing, cut off, scattered Israelite brothers out in among the nations were considered to be by the Jews. They were considered to be as Gentile. And you know what? Paul is actually echoing this exact same idea, well, in all his letters, but in, in Ephesians, for example, the only difference is he's actually addressing those very same people who are regarded as Gentiles. So he's talking to Gentiles here. So it's, and it's critical to note which Gentiles Paul is addressing in his letters. And I know that just goes whoosh, right over the head of most Christians. They're like, what do you mean with Gentiles? We know what Gentiles are. No, not according to the story you don't. Listen, listen. we should, by now within this series, we ought to know which Gentiles are in view. They are those who were made Gentile by being scattered out into the nations. They were Gentiles that were connected to that first covenant. And we ought to know that by now. You know why? Because like, for example, like I said, in Ephesians chapter 2, there are just a boatload of contextual Hello, McFly's right smack within the text that give it a dead giveaway. L let, me, let me show you what I mean. These Gentiles, according to Paul, were made dead. These Gentiles were dead in their trespass. These Gentiles had been made far off. <laughs> These Gentiles were estranged or they were strangers to God. These Gentiles had been alienated from God and from the commonwealth of Israel. Folks, the, these are all covenantal concepts. These, these are all covenantal terms that point directly to Israel's story, uh, describing conditions. The, this was the condition that their condition was in. These conditions were caused by sin under law. Sin under law. I'm not just talking general old sin. Oh, you and I, we're dead in our sins. No. These sins right here, were, were they were dead because they, they had been made dead through sin under law. Imputed sin under law. That was Israel's story in a nutshell. Redemption from the death and the curse of the law. The law which imputed Israel's sins. That's the whole of prophecy. Israel's sins would be taken care of in 70 weeks. 1 John 3, uh, verse 4. Now listen to this. I just want to do a little two-minute rabbit trail on sin here. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. So, in other words, you've got to understand here... Uh, lawlessness is exactly that. It's having a law, being aware of law, being under law, and knowingly living in contradiction to that law or going beyond the boundary of that law. So lawlessness, it's law less the obedience to it. Lawlessness. That's what it is. Uh, personally, I think the King James uh, captures the, the essence of this much better. It says, whoever commits, uh, committeth sin transgress, transgresseth, I've got a lift all of a sudden, uh, also the law, for the sin is the transgression of law. 
That's what sin is. That's what biblical sin is. It's transgressing a law. And I think that this is really compelling evidence that the Gentiles in Ephesus were descendants of Israel, and they were the children, you know, of Israel made strangers. Remember uh, Hosea 5? Made Zur, strangers, right? Through their ancestors and their own, really, forsaking of the law, lawlessness. The law killed. They had been made dead. Only Israel had the law. Hello? They were dead in trespass. Trespass, transgression against what? Well, against Yahweh's law. They were alienated from Yahweh and Israel's covenant community. Being estranged from Yahweh's covenant necessitated a prior attachment or belonging to it. Right? But... Abraham's seed, their association and attachment to the promises, qualified these uh, in, in Ephesus uh, for redemption through a new covenant. Not every Joe Blow Gentile in Ephesus, only those of Abraham's seed, those who had been made dead, could come into that new covenant, according to the story. So... This is why both Jews and Gentiles in Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2, were subject to the wrath of God in judgment, uh, and all were accountable to God's law, because they knew God, or they had known God. They had been given the law. All Israel, which entailed both houses, which meant Jews near uh, and Gentile Israelites made far. So the wrath of God. Romans 4.15. Uh, the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. So again, what were those in Ephesians trespassing? What were they transgressing, if not a law? A law that we know only belonged to Yahweh's people. So look, back to Ephesians uh, in all, all of Paul's letters, every single one of his letters for that matter, Paul never ever addresses uh, some kind of a, you know, dead to God uh, condition of all humanity uh, or the sin of all humanity. He doesn't discuss, discuss that in any kind of a genericized kind of a way. No, Paul is only addresses the sin that made people dead in their sins. And the only sin that did that was imputed sin, which was sin under the law, which only, a law which only Israel had been under. You and I are not dead in our sins. Not against the law of Yahweh, we're not. If you want to make an argument that you and I are dead in our sins in some other way, um, that's another conversation for another time. I don't think we are. Uh, but you got to understand, this is the whole aim of Israel's redemptive process, her prophecy. It's 70 weeks were determined to finish Israel's transgression, there's your trespass, and take away Israel's sin. Paul's language specifically describes the conditions created by Israel's sins under law and covenant, the first covenant. This was a condition to only a particular people made dead. Dead in their trespass against a particular law and covenant. These Ephesians were Gentile Israelites. In the nations, they had become the nations with their alienation from the commonwealth of Israel. So... All that to say, it really only makes perfect sense, I think, when Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, listen to the language. Just listen to the language and try to remember the last lesson, okay? Because I'm going to draw from that. Ephesians chapter 4, 17 through 19. You should no longer walk, you Ephesians, you who are dead in your sins. You should no longer walk. As the rest of the Gentiles walk. Don't walk like them. How are they walking? In the futility of their mind. Well, that rings a bell. 
futility of their mind, last lesson, having their understanding, remember knowledge, understanding, that belonged to Israel, their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. That was the distinction of Israel. They were alienated from God, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over. We talked about that last lesson. Israel was given over to lewdness, to work, all uncleanness. And we talked about being unclean. Israel was unclean with greediness. Man, he's like saying, hey, Gentile Israelites, stop walking as Gentiles. Hey, lost is Israelites, stop walking as the natures and the cultures in which you've been assimilated into. Hey, Israelites, stop uh, walking like the rest of those Gentiles around you. Enter into the new covenant through faith. And you know what? You won't be identified as Gentiles any longer. The condition that your condition is in has changed, or can change, or will change. So, okay. With all that is mere prelude, we're going to take a look at the curious case of Cornelius's condition. <laughs> and we'll look at his condition uh, as we um, see him drop into Peter's place to see what condition his condition was in. So I meant to get to that, but I kind of rambled. I do that sometimes. Uh, anyway, hey, we'll see you next lesson. We'll take a look at Cornelius. I promise you that. Uh, Acts chapter 10 and 11. Take a look at that first if you want. And we will look at that. We'll see you next lesson. Thanks for joining me. Adios. I just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in. I said I just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs>